Okay, so thank you everyone for uh, for joining us. It's uh, lunchtime, late morning, depending on where you're based. Um, for the IP Fabric webinar on simplified automation in financial services. So automation is, uh, as, a, as a technology itself, is a driving force behind innovation for most sectors. This webinar will focus very specifically on network automation and we'll make some points and offer some of our guidance and, and best tips based on our experience working with financial service institutions from both the global multinational scale to the local challenger banks. We'll discuss industry drivers and inherent challenges to the adoption of network automation with a very specific angle on financial services. Um, the IP Fabric approach here is not to reinvent the wheel with every approach to network management or to automation. And it's also not to wrap every single thing you could possibly need within an onerous heavy tool. We preach simplicity and we look to aid network engineers in taking their first steps in network automation or in bringing some more efficiency and repeatability to their existing well-developed automation strategies. We'll, we'll quickly introduce, we're gonna give you an overview then of the crucial challenges being addressed and then give you an insight into the IP Fabric technology, including a technical demonstration. We will be watching the chat window throughout in case you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat window there. And then we will pause at the end for a Q&A uh, opportunity and people can let us know their questions then. We'll be recording this session and it'll be available shortly afterwards for you to re-watch or to share with your colleagues. So to get started, my name's Joe Kershaw and I lead our global channel strategy. This channel is made up of global system integrators, specialist resellers, and a network of ambassadors and automation gurus, bringing a wealth of experience, knowledge, and technical prowess to the use and the development of our disruptive technology. Darren? Yeah, my name's uh, Darren Falwell. I'm, uh, as it says on the slide, the network automation evangelist with IP Fabric. I've been a network engineer for more years than I can um, I want to admit, really, uh, working in a wide variety of sectors and roles but in recent years become more engaged in the network automation community looking for really a better way of doing the things we do first came across ip fabric as a as an awesome engineering tool but soon realized um, it could be used as the foundation for an automation ecosystem really um, and joined the team a few months ago um, in order to further engagement with the network engineering community Great. Thanks, Darren. So we're just going to dive into a brief overview of some of the challenges that we're addressing here. Then we'll give you an overview of the IP Fabric technology before a quick demonstration. So the, the crucial industry drivers which push financial services as forward as an industry and also challenge organizations and technical teams to deliver um, are specific to financial services, but also relevant elsewhere. They begin with customer expectations. As a customer, I personally am expecting my financial uh, services to be available anywhere. I want to be able to push through a transaction whilst I'm on holiday. I want to be able to move money between my accounts whilst on my laptop at work or connected in a coffee shop via my mobile. This experience of jumping from device to device and interface to interface needs to be seamless for me. I need to see that systems are supported, there's no pop-up errors, there's no issues with my authentication. This seamless experience is crucial and I need to know that the bank or the insurance company or anyone that I'm working with has secure data management processes but also that these processes are transparent. The second driver in the market is competition. These ever-increasing demands from the customers are opening up holes in the uh, previously bulletproof uh, reputation and service of the big banks and fintechs and challenger banks are, are really gobbling up this opportunity and the lack of customer loyalty is driven by this demand it's driven by the new range of services exploding onto the market but it's also driven by regulation 
regulation is twofold, if not many more fold within uh, financial services. But some examples are that of PSD2, which is opening up market competition because I can now decide at the flip of a switch, I no longer want to be with this bank. I want to take my services, my money and all my data and transition those into another organization. And the bank has no way of stopping that. PCI, on the other hand, represents a challenge for organizations because the business and the management team see this as crucial. It's almost a certification and entry into the market that has to be watched. Whereas at implementation level for engineers, PCI represents a tick box exercise, masses of manual data checks, audit requirements, which have to be maintained pre and post changes, pre and post project. It's something that's an ongoing burden for engineers. The key considerations within financial services that need to be considered, obviously customer expectation translates technically into customer experience. The customer experience or the customer to bank relationship is based on, I will give you my loyalty and my trust in return and only in return for a perfectly delivered application experience and banking experience and a trusted brand. This brand and perfect delivery are absolutely linked to service continuity. A service outage can have massive impact on an organization's brand with the ability of customers now to move away from their banks. Service outage represents a definite impact on revenue as well. Final consideration that we touch on here is that the financial service organizations are looking at a global footprint. This is a global reach of customers this is single customers using their services globally, maybe wanting to access things whilst on holiday in different destinations, in strange destinations, and they will not trust this brand if the service is being blocked. This is also coupled with branch networks and a global organization of employees from banking employees that are accessing critical data to internal technical employees that are crucial for delivering the service. The business expectations do not change and they don't really care about the amount of complexity that organizations are dealing with in their technical teams. They expect a single service or self-service um, delivery of infrastructure so that they can spin up their applications, spin down their applications, access the data they require and ensure that it's completely secure. We'll touch on some of the crucial challenges here before going into a lot more detail in the next slide. But the transition from the tra traditional space of outsourced infrastructure to the understanding now that infrastructure is the platform, it is the foundation for successful delivery of services and brand, mean that in-housing this previously outsourced technology means that technical debt is carried with it. A status quo of do we really want to switch off our trusted, stable, heavy on-premise solutions for something that's more innovative and disruptive? This is something that needs to be managed in, uh, in financial services specifically. And the final point on resources, this is how can you plan an infrastructure strategy, be able to move between vendors, be able to adopt new technologies such as private and public cloud and software-defined networking, with having a, without having a resource flexibility underneath it. The ability to plan your resources, know when you need skills, be able to onboard consultants and external service providers, but also be able to bring junior engineers into the network and help them to add value to the business. So resources are a critical challenge as well. Darren, do you want to take these challenges into a bit more detail and give an insight into IP Fabric? Yeah, thanks, John. In order to maintain service, as, as Joe mentioned, financial services organisations have traditionally tended to grow their infrastructure by addition of new environments to older ones rather than take a, a rip and replace approach. As a result, there is, as, as Joe mentioned, a significant degree of complexity in their IT and thus technical debt almost by design. For example, consider an extreme case. A bank may have a traditional mainframe environment, but supplement that with an e-commerce platform with its multiple firewall layers, switches, load balancers, physical server infrastructure. 
It may have a converged server infrastructure connected to big chassis-based switching platforms. And that may be pa paired with a newer private cloud data center environment with hyper-converged virtual servers and leaf-spine networks. You might see low latency switching infrastructures for trading floors or public cloud connectivity for development teams third-party IPsec VPN for B2B or DMZ for presenting customer-facing service, even internal firewalls for application of security policy to meet regulatory obligations like PCI, um, private and public WAN, encryption and unencrypted, traditional software-defined, multiple generations of switched and wireless campus networks, et cetera, et cetera, the, the list goes on. All of this leads to interconnected pockets of network provision, often from different vendors. These routers, switches, firewalls, wireless LAN controllers, and so on, may be traditional network platforms accessed over each vendor's unique CLI. They may be software-defined or cloud-managed platforms accessed over a GUI and ultimately through an API presented on a controller. Or there may be public cloud platforms, for example, AWS, Azure, Google, Oracle, again, provisioned and maintained through automation, through scripts, through APIs. In order to manage and maintain that complexity, IP Fabric uses an automated vendor agnostic discovery process to capture as much network data as it can then analyze it in order to collate that single definitive inventory of network devices and create a configuration and state database, which allows it to build connectivity topology tables and maps to determine relationships between nodes at all layers across all technology features. So layer two, layer three, routing protocols, multicast, quad security, you name it and verify that the network as a whole meets the intent that's been expressed in its configuration and is mandated by regulation. Through the user interface, you can then get access to all of that data that you, that you would have had to have updated your manual spreadsheets or, or Word documents with, but it's all searchable. All the diagrams automatically assembled and filtered to give you exactly the viewpoint that you need compliance check reports to verify the behavior of a network is as you expect it to be and as per your business policies. And then you have past simulations and gory forensic data about the state of the technologies in, uh, deployed in your network to accelerate troubleshooting. Essentially, you've ensured your network has up-to-date deep documentation at all times. And then we come to the API, which provides access to all of that data in the platform so that IP Fabric can be used as an engine for automated network operations. Imagine being able to discover new devices when they're added to the network, to update your monitoring platform automatically, then go back to the devices and run an Ansible playbook to update their configuration to allow them to be monitored. Um, you could have a, a user raise a ticket in Remedy that triggers uh, an IP fabric path check, the results from which are automatically added back to the ticket before an analyst or engineer even see it. Or even creating of automatic tickets when a specific behavior of the network goes out of compliance due to a change that's had unintended consequences. The, the possibilities are limitless. But the first stage to automating network operations is to have that thorough and accurate inventory. And many of the initial network projects started by network engineers concern themselves with the discovery of that inventory. IP Fabric can shortcut that process by carrying out that discovery and analysis for you, leaving you to focus on the real value adds of automation. And our community of partners and customers are working on these types of projects right now with IP Fabric at the heart of the ecosystem, collecting, analyzing, and making sense of the network. So we're gonna go into uh, a quick demonstration of some of the features of IP Fabric um, in order to show you just exactly how we can use the, uh, the platform in that form. Just bear with me while I... Just as Darren's up. transitioning across, um, 
feel free if anything isn't completely clear during the demonstration to just ping a message through on chat and I'll answer you as best as possible. But of course, this demonstration is just a teaser, give you an idea into some of the capabilities so you can get in touch with us afterwards and go into a lot more detail to your specific use cases. Thanks, Joe. So hopefully you can now see the, the demo screen. We can. Um, and I'm just going to full screen that. There we go. So uh, as you can see, IP Fabric is a snapshot based system. It records a discovered inventory, topology, configuration and state of the network in a point of time database. The discovery process is very efficient in terms of approach and time taken and storage space used. Rather than port scanning everything it finds and triggering security alerts, the, network, the system walks the network in the same way that a network engineer would if they were logging in for the first time. And you can see here for the, um, our demo environment has 600 and odd devices. Um, in 11 minutes, we were able to, to discover the, uh, the updated state um, on disk that's stored in a, in a mere 19 meg, so uh, very efficient. Most customers all run those snapshots once or twice a day, though there's no limit to how often you run it, as long as you've got the bandwidth available and the storage space. You can limit the number of concurrent sessions um, into devices and you can limit the amount of bandwidth that those sessions consume. So you're minimizing the impact on the network at large when those snapshots are being run. Now the output from that discovery process can be seen in uh, the inventory tables. For example, you um, get a full view here of the, all the discovered devices in the network, their location, their management details, uh, the vendor platform family, serial number, code version, everything you'd hope for. Um, if we look at our site L1, for example, you can see the range of different vendors, um, Extreme, Cisco, F5, Quagga, Checkpoint, HP, Juniper, um, and so on. There's, there's a, a wide range there available. Um, you can also get um, a view of the installed modules and all the other uh, part numbers that have serial numbers associated with them. So SFPs, DAC cables, power supplies, um, hard disks, you know, all of the elements are there. Um, and you can get to see where switches form part of a stack. Um, in, in IP Fabric, um, stacks are treated as a single manageable device. And so uh, you can see how those are, are broken down in this table. We also have, um, we maintain end of life milestones for, for all of our, our equipment. Now in our demo environment at the moment, we only have one device that's infected by that. But uh, again, that's, that's a, a multi-vendor um, capability. And you can see that all of that is really useful information for your maintenance and support contracts for your, your CMDB, but also for your monitoring platforms and your ticketing systems and all of your network automation tooling. That information will all come in handy. Now in these tables we also include information about interface utilization. Really useful for managing resource and those those questions that come up from time to time, like, uh, I don't know, um, can you give me all the um, Ethernet interfaces that we have in um, our leaf switches, in our data center, um, which are currently available um, for, for me to connect new stuff? Simply by filtering on that table, we can see there are 242 items there uh, listed, um, and we can see which, which ports those are because that information is there and centralized and available to us. We can also pull um, from the host table here, the endpoints that are connected to those, those switch ports. So for example, um, if we want to know where the server, um, one of the servers sits in, in our data center environment, type that IP address properly, um, we can see there that, that 10661281112 is, is connected to this switch port and this um, uh, environment and that's its default gateway you know so we have all that information at our fingertips and all of this information is not only available through this web UI but we have the opportunity to export that um, out either to CSV um, or 
if we click through in here, it can demonstrate that all of that's available through the API as well. And in fact, IP Fabric will tell you how to retrieve that information through the, the API. You can simply take that payload, paste it into Postman or, or um, into your uh, Python scripting and be able to, to retrieve that information directly. Now with all of this information stored centrally, you can see how this could be used as a single point of automated documentation for your network. Particularly when you start looking at the technology tables here. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but you can see there, um, there's some uh, really particularly useful information in here about, for example, which VLANs are in use in which locations. We've got information about spanning tree. We've got information about routing, MPLS, multicast, security, quality of service. All of the, um, the gory uh, configuration information you might need, but all in one place. And of course, um, IP Fabric um, generates diagrams of, of the environment. So you're able to, for example, click through Onto, um, onto a site. We're currently viewing the routing information here, but if we enable um, layer one and layer two, we can start to see the full topology. Um, we can also have custom views that we can retrieve back to give a, a, a tidier view. And here you can see on the left-hand side, we have um, routing yeah, we can see from the, the, the purple color that these are layer three uh, relationships between the routers. On the right hand side, we can see um, we have layer two relationships running spanning tree, so it's the switched environment. And if we zoom in on those a little further, we can see more detail on that. Um, and the uh, on the routing side here, for example, you can see there's some extra stuff information grouped. If we ungroup it, the green and the, and the yellow here show where we have BGP relationships and OSPF relationships between our devices. So we can basically customize that view to give us exactly the information that we want um, all in one place without having to manually um, draw this stuff up in Visio. <clears throat> so you can see how we can replace that traditional documentation with what we collect in, in IP Fabric, but this does go further than that. The diagramming capability also supports end-to-end um, -end pass simulation in the network, which amongst other things we can use to support security compliance validation. Let's say for example, um, that we have a site 66 alongside our, our head office site. Site 66 is a data center. Okay, and we can just bring that up onto the diagram alongside here. This data center supports a number of server VLANs and a virtualized server farm hanging off the, the switching infrastructure at the end here. Um, it also has uh, an internal firewall that, that basically protects all of those, those VLANs from, um, uh, basically provides um, security control to all those, those server VLANs. <clears throat> so we have a specific VLAN 124 which sits in, in this switching infrastructure, that's gonna be used for PCI servers. Um, and so the firewall will have security control to stop non-PCI uh, clients from accessing that. We have a client VLAN 116, which um, lives up in our um, head office up here. And that is considered um, authorized to access those PCI systems. And we have another one, let's say 119, which isn't. What we can do is we can do our end-to-end -end path check to prove out that that is indeed the case. Let me uh, bring that up. Okay, so um, if we take a client that sits in VLAN 116, this is in our PCI, PCI client VLAN, our server is, is sitting in this VLAN 124, which is um, in the data center, and we can check that on the web service port that uh, that path, what that path looks like. And here you go, that from end to end, we can now see that our client in, in the data center environment, and you can see how it hops through the network across the MPLS environment into the data center to get the path through to the, to the server at the end here. And you can see the firewall is passing that traffic through. You've got a layer three and a layer two path there. Let me 
me just turn off layer, layer two just so that it's clearer. And you can see happy um, traffic passes with, without any problem. If I click on the firewall, it shows me here that I have a forwarding, both a forwarding path and that my zone matching rules allow that traffic to pass. If I now go to the VLAN, which isn't um, allowed access to that server and click on submit, I get the same response, except my firewall has now gone red. So again, if I turn off the layer two and zoom in on this, my firewall, which is now red, has the same forwarding rules because it still knows how to get to that destination, but the zone matching rules have failed. And I've got a deny here that I'm, I'm hitting in, in the rule set. And if I check through on the detail of that, I'm going to uh, host 124, which is where those PCI servers live. You can see um, my permit statement that I've got in the middle here only allows traffic from uh, 116. So you can see there really, really very clearly, very quickly, how um, IP Fabric has helped us with its end-to-end -end path check do that. Now, what we can do is we can actually save, uh, define that as a path check that runs every time a snapshot is created so that we're able to determine, okay, um, if, if a change has occurred in the network or whatever, does that status change or is it maintained as part of the reporting? You can see here at the moment, I'm expecting the 119 to fail and that's um, ticked and saying, yes, that's, that's exactly the, the right status right now. But imagine we need to make, raise a change. For all of a sudden, things change. Things in the network change all the time, right? So we need to um, ensure now that VLAN 119 is allowed to access the PCI um, servers. Perhaps we've got a, a new area in, in the network, in the head office, a new team uh, set up that need access to, to that platform. We can use this end-to-end -end path check now as um, change validation, pre and post change validation. So we've already here, we can see pre-change, things are, are, are blocking at the firewall for those things. But let's, let's raise a change let's change the configuration of the firewall and see how um, the end-to-end -end path check can be used to prove that the change has completed successfully. So if you bear with me here, as um, the demo gods being with us, um, hopefully we should be able to, to log in to the, the firewall and do that very thing. And as ever, um, the, the demo gods, uh, aren't smiling quite as much as I'd hope, but let's uh, see what we can do. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so I'm just gonna go into the configuration mode um, on here and the uh, thing I need to do is I need to edit the address book. Um, there we go. So I need to edit the security uh, address book um, on the firewall. and um, basically add um, to the address set um, called PCI clients. I need to add the address for the, um, for that VLAN 119. Okay, so that's added, added that in there. Um, and if I just do a quick show on that one. Um, show on that one. You can see now that uh, 116 and 119 are now allowed. I commit that change and that's now writing the configuration back to the firewall but obviously this is still showing red because as far as as IP fabric is concerned it hasn't retrieved any new information so what we what we do is we go to refresh the data um, relating to our firewall we um, put the host name in here select it and click on refresh and essentially so so uh, what's now happening is that uh, IP Fabric has, has paused the snapshot. Um, it's basically making that unavailable for people while it goes ahead and refreshes that information. Um, it will go, it will log back into the firewall. It will retrieve the configuration and the state. Um, it then looks, thinks, looks again at its relationships with the surrounding devices and recomputes its, its immediately surrounding topology for the diagrams. Now, obviously, if we'd made a change that was further reaching, 
um, that had an impact on routing tables or on MAC address tables or, or um, state wider in the network would have had to have um, gone away and fetched a, a, a wider scope of, of state uh, in the rediscovery. But because we're just focusing on the security rules on, on the one device, um, we can focus on, on just rediscovering the, uh, the firewall there. So while that progresses, Now, um, as, a, as I say, what we're doing here, we're, we're proving out that uh, from, a, from a change, as, as part of a change process, this is how you be built into the, uh, into the, the tasks that you'd do. You'd have a, a capture of the, the state before the change, make the change itself, capture the state after the change. And then as part of your, um, your mop up of the change um, process, you would then execute these checks. And what we can now do is we can go through to the, uh, the end to end path, uh, submit that, and we can see that our firewall has now gone blue. Um, that if we click through there, um, our zone matching rules are good. And um, that if we check on the uh, host 24, which is where the, the server sits, we can now see that 119 has been added into the, the list of, of addresses that are allowed access to that server. Um, and just to prove it, we can try um, another uh, VLAN that we haven't granted access to just to prove, yes, it is still failing. So we haven't opened up configuration to everything. Um, we've, we've limited it to, to just the uh, um, the items in the change in VLAN 119 specifically. Hopefully, um, you know, we've, we've not gone through a comprehensive demo there, but we've shown just how IP Fabric can address some of the inventory and compliance requirements on the network through its automated discovery and its intent verification capability. Um, what we'll do now is we'll just pause this and we'll head back to the, uh, back to the, the uh, presentation. Just bear with me. Okay, so the, the key takeaways um, really that we're trying to, to get to with this um, are the ones that we see on the slide here and the ones that we mentioned at, at the top really. From an inventory perspective, the inventory has to represent a source of truth and trust. You've got to feed verified data into the CMDB and that creates a powerful strategic tool which underpins commercial investments, maintenance contracts, automation workflows and operational process and systems. Leaving this to be manually maintained introduces unnecessary risk and operational inefficiency. With IP Fabric, we can automate that discovery and maintenance of the network inventory. That same inventory can then be shared with other platforms and systems to ensure consistency using its API integration. No more requirement to manually update multiple inventories for different purposes. From a compliance perspective, annual audits for regulatory compliance can cost significant time and effort. Building automated reporting that's updated at more regular intervals significantly improves the efficiency. And extending that reporting to include company policy and configuration expectations also helps to maintain consistency. And it offers peace of mind to technology and business leadership. It also allows us to consider automating proactive resolution of network anomalies to deliver a predictable infrastructure and resilient services to the business. Also, as we've seen, providing the ability to validate network state before and after changes using network simulation helps ensure accuracy of the change implementation and improves the level of trust in that network change process. So from an automation adoption perspective, while automation is a big talking point, network engineers are still really considering their approach, how to gain management sign off and how to take the next steps. So our thoughts are these. When you're assessing your project, look to see how it delivers a measurable result and aligns with business outcomes. Consider 
how it op improves operational feedback or processes or reporting. Weigh up the best approach for the project at hand. For example, IP Fabric can deliver all the discovery and a lot of your automated analysis requirements. Look to borrow scripts or codes that can extract IP Fabric data and manipulate it. And only when there isn't anything else available, consider building the code yourself. Get involved in the network automation communities so you don't need to reinvent the wheel at every term. It gives you a source of code and scripts, but also of experience, expertise who may be able to help you along the path. Consider joining the many Slack groups, Network to Code, for example, um, where we have an IP Fabric channel. But there are thousands of users registered who are sharing ideas and having conversations about network automation daily. We've listed a few useful links here, and obviously um, you'll have uh, these in the uh, in the notes and the slides afterwards. Um, but we've got the the Network to Code Slack uh, channel there that we mentioned, um, our YouTube channel. There's videos there on um, using APIs and and our um, automation uh, adventures series where we're we're walking through using IP Fabric as the the center of that automation ecosystem. Um, my GitHub repository there has um, sample uh, code and uh, Postman collections and those sorts of things that are uh, of interest if you're starting down that path. And we also have um, a trial, a 30 day trial available for IP Fabric for network uh, engineers who are interested in looking into automation. Joe. Great, thanks Darren. So. What we're going to do now is we're going to wrap up, but just before we do, we'll open up for 90 seconds for people to put any questions they may have into the chat, and then we'll review the questions before we do close up. And again, as I mentioned at the top, we, uh, we will share recording of this and some details around the, the content that Darren pointed to at the end. So if you've got any questions now, please feel, to, feel free to type them into the, the chat or the Q&A function, and uh, we'll review very shortly. Okay, we've just had uh, had one question come in there, so we'll I'll pick that one up before we uh, uh, get any others. So, so uh, Martin asked how difficult it is to deploy um, IP Fabric in the environment. It's a very very simple deployment. It's um, it, it ships as a as an OVA, um, single OVA that you install on a on a relatively small virtual machine um, under VMware. Um, if you if you check out the um, automation uh, adventure uh, series of videos you'll see that in in i think it was episode three where i actually do that installation and it's really really fast um it probably installs in in half an hour um and the first discovery well you've already seen how quick a discovery is in the network it can you can literally within a day you can have an environment up and running and and um, providing an instant investment return Great. Thanks, Darren. So just one more question come in here. Thanks for answering that one. One question here is, how does IP Fabric actually help with compliance? Fairly uh, straightforward question, but uh, do you want to take that one, Darren? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a really good point, actually. It, uh, um, with the um, intent verification capability, we're able to report on um, uh, being able to, to run checks against configuration and, uh, and so on. And so those, those reports run every time a snapshot is created. Um, so, so daily or twice daily. Uh, and so you're able to get an uh, you know, automated instant um, view, I suppose, on, on how configuration in the network and how state of the network is um, uh, meets or, or doesn't the, the, uh, the stipulations within regulations. Compare and contrast that with um, what, what used to be the case for, for PCI uh, regulation, where you may, maybe take half of your network team off for a week to go and manually trawl through the network, um, collating all the information they, they needed to in order to meet those, those audit requirements. Um, you can see a, a sort of big improvement there. Great. Thanks, Darren. So if there's no more questions, guys, let's, uh, let's wrap it up now. And uh, again, we'll get the recording across to you with all the content. 
but realistically this was just meant as a bit of a teaser I want to get you interested feel free to reach out to us via LinkedIn or via email and uh, I would love to set up a separate demo to do a one-to-one -one with your teams and go into the the nuances of your own environment and the crucial challenges that you're facing as a networking team really look forward to seeing you guys in the uh, in the slack channel and getting involved in the community and uh, hopefully we can speak to you again soon so thanks again for joining yeah thanks for your time everybody Thanks, Darren. Cheers.